Hello, so my name is Skyler. I'm a second year CSEC. Uh, I've been running a honeypot for um, just about one year. Um, you can see that it's uh, captured a lot of data, uh, about 22 gigs. Um, Calorie does not store its data in a very information dense format, so that's a little misleading, but yeah. So what is a honeypot? <clears throat> there are low versus high interaction honeypots. So low honeypot, low interaction honeypot is like an emulated system or not really like a real system um, or like a service. Um, and then a high interaction honeypot is like a VM or an actual box an attacker can interact with. Um, and there's production honeypots versus research honeypots. So a production honeypot is um, you can have it in your production environment to um, you can keep going. All right. Um, to see if there's someone, if there's attackers inside your network. So if it all of a sudden starts talking a lot, you know that um, you like your network's been breached because it shouldn't be. Um, and then there's research honeypots, and research honeypots um, are just for like observing attacker behavior and seeing what techniques they use. Um, so Kauri. Calorie supports SSH and Telnet. Um, it logs credentials, shell interactions. It saves downloaded files. It supports SFTP, um, TFTP, or yeah. Um, and they call it medium interaction. It's just all the commands that you can run on SSH are emulated through um, Python, or they just send a file um, straight. Um, and it also has a high interaction mode. That's not what I use, but you can set it up to use VMs, and then an attacker can actually interact with a VM. Um, so the main way that um, the worms and like bots that I saw would um, attack boxes is bad passwords. So they would just try a bunch of credentials and try to get in. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, password, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, if you had uh, root one two three four five six as the as valid credentials on your box, you would be hacked in on average once an hour, or someone tried that once an hour. If you have it on port twenty two on the open internet, uh, there was also stuff like this one qaz two wsx uh, that looks like it's a good password. It's eight characters. It's got numbers. There are also ones like one qaz two wsx. Um, with an exclamation point. Um, that might look like it's a good password to password policies, um, but it's not because it's just a pattern and so lots of people use it as their password. Um, and there was 13,000 attempts with that. Um, also default password, so Oracle, Oracle, Pi, Raspberry, uh, root osboxes.org. That specific one, um, osboxes.org is a VPS, so they by default don't allow SSH on the boxes that they set up for you. But uh, a lot of people would set up SSH on their boxes and then get hacked because they didn't change their password. Um, and that thing on the top, there was a router company that um, by default, uh, the credentials were admin with no password and they didn't force you to change it. Uh, and there was a lot of people on like forums and things saying they'd been hacked because they opened SSH and then, yeah. Um, so this is a uh, box plot of number of attempts by IP. So most of the things would leave, most of the bots would leave after like 200, like most of them were in the uh, one to like just over 100 range attempts, um, but there was some that went up to like 55,000 attempts. Um, there was one that had, I think it was like 50,000 attempts in 24 hours, so that's like one attempt per second. Um, and that was actually a DigitalOcean IP, and they say they stop abuse on their platform. But uh, that IP, I checked like weeks afterwards, and they were still going um, on abuse IPDB. So I don't know if they actually catch anything. Um, so. This is one thing that I would see a lot of stuff like this. Um, does anyone know why they would want CPU information and memory information? 
looking for to be just at the best place? Um, maybe, but most of it was um, uh, like cryptocurrency miners. So if you have like a good enough CPU, they'll drop a XMR, rhino, XMR miner, yeah, something like that to make money. Uh, that's an example of like one of the miners. Um, and you can see we actually get their XMR um, address right in there. Um, and XMR is a cryptocurrency. Uh, that's another one that's kind of fun. Uh, they would kill a bunch of other miners. And this one just left after doing that. It didn't drop a payload or anything. Uh, so this is actually the one from this one. You can see 4 or 5, four or five P2, all that. Um, so they made um, just about $1,000. They don't have any active miners anymore. I don't know what happened to their botnet, but it's gone now. Um, and you can see that their monorail address starts with a 4, which means it's their actual monorail address. Um, the third one that I have, this one starts with an 8, which means it's a sub address, which means, so this one, unless they have multiple addresses, that's all of the money they've made. But with the one that started with an 8, it's, po it's very easy to make a bunch of sub addresses. So um, this one made $1,000. You can see there's a bunch of hosts. Um, you can actually see like this one, 61.139.143.254. Uh, that's probably the IP address of the box. Uh, so they must have set the host name to the IP address. Um, or the host name isn't available. I don't know exactly how this works. Um, and you can see that this one was a pretty new one. Um, they're estimated to make 28 XMR every single year, and that's $8,000 a year. And they've only made um, $1,000 so far. And so this is an example of uh, that command, strings XMR awk. So strings gets all, print, all sequences of printable characters in a binary. And then I just used awk to get all length 95 strings because XMR addresses are always 95 in length. Um, and this one starts with an H, 8, which means that it's very possible that they have um, multiple sub-addresses. So this isn't like all of the money they've made. Um, this is as an example of one of the domains that I saw um, uh, payloads being downloaded from. So you can't get very much information from it. it they are registered in Romania, um, and everything is GDPR mass. So you can't actually get any information on who hosts the domain. Um, also, the IP address is behind Cloud, Cloudflare. Um, and so it had, on the website, there was password lists, um, IP range files. In it was um, DigitalOcean IP range files. I saw that. Um, there was also an RSC C2, um, a speed test. I'm guessing that's for like DDoS type stuff. I'm not entirely sure. There was also an XMR miner. Um, and so it's registered in Romania, and the GDP per capita of Romania is $12,000. And the first address that I had, like as an example, they made $1,000. So that's like one tenth of like. Uh, average person's income in Romania made from something like this. Um, so persistence, uh, a lot of them would add public keys. They would change passwords, create accounts. Um, looking at strings in the binaries, um, they would add all sorts of ways of having startup commands. Um, this example, this one wasn't found on VirusTotal. A lot of them would download shell scripts to download an additional payload. Um, so this one, it's kind of terrible code because it's doing the CD each and every time it's doing the download. And it also doesn't um, just check the architecture and then download specific a specific payload for the architecture of the victim machine. Um, and you can see that there's a bunch of different um, downloads for each of the architectures. 
Um, and this was not found on VirusTotal, and the payloads downloaded also weren't found on VirusTotal. Uh, this one was found on VirusTotal. It was written in 2012. Uh, it's still finding its way around the internet. Um, it's like a DDoS thing. So this came with a SSH brute forcer, and it just um, is a worm that um, self-replicates. And the IRC server that this was connected to um, is no longer up. But So then as a demo, um, I can actually show um, people logging in. So if you go to one, if you SSH into 157.230.54.162 with the username RITSEC with any password, um, it should work. And um, so, yeah, you can actually get the, what is that? <laughs> uh, is that like a macOS thing? I don't know. Uh, but it's not actually a real shell. A lot of commands won't work, but um, yeah. Oh yeah, if you have a public key, I have all public keys accepted right now. But it's also it's literally just responds that who goes there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, so some of the commands are a little bit different than you'd think. Well, you can try um, if you cat the hello.c file and then compile it uh, and then run it. It's a little bit different than you would expect for it to be. But yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Questions? Sorry. Questions? <laughs> so what was your, um, maybe I missed this, what was your initial reason for creating a, a honeypot? So I didn't say it, but um, I had set up like servers on my like home network before, and I had failed a ban. And I looked at my logs one day, and there was like 8,000 attempts. And so I tried setting it up on, I just wanted to see how it would look from, or how many attempts there would be on like a VPS. Um, so like on DigitalOcean or something like that. And so yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, thank you, Skyler. Um, hold on a second. I will get you your lanyard by the end of this meeting. Uh, right. Will you be here? Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'll get you to then. Cool. Awesome. All right, thank you, Skyler, for an amazing presentation. Um, next up, we have AT with Dorking with Pastebin. Awesome. Clap it up.